I'm Steve Farmlow, the host of the Top Gun Show. What I've prepared for you is a short three-part mini-series documentary on the indirect sales channel in telecommunications. I've created this to benefit all of the constituents of the channel. Why? What I've discovered is that more education is needed to take better advantage of the benefits of the indirect sales channel. We will explore the past, the present, and the future of the channel, as well as some of the best practices. Whether you are a provider or carrier, or if you are a sales agent or partner, if you're a value-added reseller, or if you're an end user, I would like this series to increase your understanding of the many benefits of the indirect sales channel. Enjoy, and thanks for watching. Since the beginning of time, people have had the insatiable desire to communicate with each other for a variety of reasons. It is the nature of humankind to communicate, share stories, notify each other of danger, celebrate life's moments, and in business, inform customers of our value proposition. We all have a story to tell. Communication technologies are the vehicle we all use to get our stories told. These technologies have evolved as mankind has evolved. We started out sharing smoke signals across the valleys. This was followed by the Pony Express, Telegraph, Telegram, US Mail Service, the landline telephone, and now cell phones. In my lifetime, we have gone from pink while you were out message notes to instant forms of communication such as SMS texting and all forms of social media messaging. While the technology has changed dramatically, the basic need has been to stay connected. People and businesses have a strong desire to be connected. Staying connected is the common denominator. Because the work from home environment is here to stay, the need to be connected is very likely more important today than ever. The world is moving fast. We are bombarded with messaging. We are also inundated with threats such as cyber attacks, ransomware, and data hijacking. However, the technologies continue to evolve in order to continue to satisfy that insatiable desire to staying connected with each other. In this documentary, we will explore the foundation of the telecommunications industry with a focus on the indirect sales channel. We will find out what it is, when it started, and why it started. We will also come to the realization that there is much more to come. Everything has not yet been invented. There are new technologies and new opportunities on the horizon that will simply blow your mind. The Top Gun Show has provided the business community with over 500 interviews of the industry leaders and the top guns in the telecommunications industry. With over several million total episode views, the Top Gun Show has brought together the names, faces, personalities, organizations, and technologies that make it all happen. Now, we pull it all together to give you the secrets and keys to success you need to take advantage of the continuous waves of opportunity that roll in. Together, we will discover the untapped potential in the telecommunications industry through the indirect sales channel. We have brought together some of the industry icons to share their past, present, and future thoughts. So sit back, relax, and take it all in.
The current state of the indirect sales channel is going through a once in a generation shift. The indirect sales channel has never been better. The indirect sales channel has never been in a better place. It was so exciting to wake up in the morning and, and go to work. But it was hard. That was the first couple of years, but really hard. Are providers and carriers really best served to reach customers through the indirect sales channel and why? If you take the simplistic view that direct sales are less expensive than indirect, you will be wrong. Um, the churn is typically higher. Um, it is more difficult to get a sale, close a sale. It takes longer to contract when you contract direct. It's not cheaper to go direct. It's not. Um, and I've looked at it a lot of different ways and a lot of different ways. The pros for going direct are the ability to control 100% of the activity of that direct sell sales force. The average uh, technology solution broker may have six or 700 uh, vendor products available through that. They're not going to focus on, on one of them exclusively all day long. Your direct seller, on the other hand, um, is paid to focus directly just on your product. Now, on the cons, uh, they only sell your product. So when they get in front of a customer, unlike when a customer um, hears from a partner, they're just selling your brand, where conversely, if the partner is selling ABC brand, the partner has the perception with the customer of having a plethora of choices and they've picked ABC brand because it's the best for their customer. Pro, direct seller will concentrate on your product all day long. Con, um, they only have your product to focus on so they're not seen as real credible. The other con with direct sellers we're seeing right now, they're costly, they're hard to find. Uh, the turnover is very high um, and the success rate is very low. Um, switching barriers are pretty high in technology. Um, it's not as easy to just come in and sell your stuff. Um, from a pro standpoint on the channel, they have the relationship already with the customer. They're seen as agnostic. Um, they speed up the sales cycle. Tracking right now in enterprise about four and a half months faster uh, through a partner than through a direct seller. Uh, and uh, and finally, you know, because they're in those accounts, they hear about needs a lot more often. Their cons, they are costly. It's not the cheapest thing. They're horrible marketers, right? They've got hundreds of vendors that they could sell. So, you know, keeping them motivated is, is, is kind of a con as well. It's not an either or. Uh, it's a both. If you look at any company in any industry, in any market, there's a TAM. There's a total addressable market size. A percentage of those customers buy direct. There's now a percentage of every market that buys through marketplaces. And that's the fastest growing. One third of the U.S. economy on the consumer side is now run via marketplaces. And a big percentage of each market goes indirect. So when you're looking at direct versus indirect, it's not really an either or, it's a both. Even if the customer buys direct, there are seven partners on average at every customer. They may not collect the customer's money, but they're doing the pre, during, and post sales activity that drive customers for life. That's the big difference today. Every product you buy today as a consumer and a, as a business person comes out of a world where it's a product skew that, that's bought through some distributor or wholesale, moves through a linear channel. Every one of those companies is considering either they have or moving it to subscription. So instead of a million dollar server, it's $9,000 a month forever. Now, in terms of those subscription economy, they're now moving and thinking about consumption. So instead of $9,000 a month forever, it's actually on the basis of consumption, the adoption of the product, the integrations, the stickiness, and all of those things that are driving the future economy. So whether you're looking to buy a car 10 years from now, whether you're looking to buy a toothbrush, whether you're looking to buy telecom gear and everything else, we're moving through these phases. At least 76% of companies, according to Accenture, are going through this business model transformation in the next five years. And they think that their current business model is unrecognizable to what's coming. And partners are an extremely important element for driving the stages through the different business models. The indirect sales channel provides a unique ability for provider because it brings leverage. I remember uh, 10 years ago, uh, Mark Benioff, uh, CEO and founder of uh, Salesforce said, I just hit a billion dollars in revenue 
and started laying out his plan to get to 10 billion, what he said was that the only way for Salesforce to get to 10 billion was to get at least a third from the channel. At the time, they were getting zero from the channel. I would argue that it's essential for any provider that is looking to grow faster than the industry is growing to grab market share to have a channel strategy. Common sense tells you that the channel is where it's at. When you're using the channel, when you're using a good channel partner, they understand the right channel partners, understand the right types of technologies. So I'm always a proponent that we go through the channel to meet our customer needs. I think channel partners are very well served to obviously support the customers because they're unbiased. A channel partner, they're a neutral party. So they analyze the customer's problem. They can present the solutions to those problems in an unbiased manner. So I think they're very well positioned because they're always looking at what's best for the customer. They do it from an unbiased perspective. Looking at the customer, these customers are being forced to do more with less. So I think at the end of the day, both sides are positioned very well to embrace, obviously, the thing that you and I love the most, which is the channel strategy. Why do you think the potential and economic power of the indirect sales channel is exponential, like even more so today than it was, you know, 15, 20 years ago? Why is the channel stronger and and exponentially larger today than it was 15, 20 years ago? I mean, there's so many factors. It's the evolution that took place. There were building blocks all the way through in the history of the channel. Um, And and some of it was product focused, you know, a shift from local dial tone to competitive local exchange services, you know, Celex, huge game changer, changed everything, you know, allowed a legitimacy because now you could go talk to customers about a more integrated solution, you know, the development of the modern internet, huge game changer. And the channel was there to take advantage of it. You know, the shift to selling data services and and addressing the wide area network, the WAN, you know, through initially frame relay, you know, and and, and then the other technologies that we all know have come to follow. The channel was there all the way, along the way to help it evolve. And I think why it's so important today is because the folks that really weren't able to make that transition through those services and understand that they have to always be adapting to meet the needs of the market and these these enterprise customers or mid-level customers. What's happened today is that there's been an elevation of the skill in the companies that represent the suppliers, the agents, and they're not talking bits and bytes. That's just not the conversation. The members of the channel who have made it this far have changed the conversation. And that's been a huge deal. And I think that's why it's legitimate. All customers are beginning to understand, wow, this is a superior way to buy technology. I mean, this makes a lot of sense. You know, I've got someone who doesn't really care about the logo on a bill. We're talking about how do we help you meet your strategic objectives by applying technology. And that's why it's different and that's why it's more powerful. I think that uh, it's, it's that re- recurring revenue has replaced, um, you know, the way people were buying, uh, you, know, uh, you know, was it CapEx versus OpEx, right? Uh, you know, that was the conversation that was, we were trying to have that conversation. Now that conversation doesn't need to be had because it's already, it's already mainstream, right? So now it's more like who, who's sinking a ton of cash into a, an, a system that's going to be antiquated the week after they install it. Why does the indirect channel have, a, have an advantage over the direct channel? Because we can literally pull a chair over to your desk and say, Steve, let's, let's try to understand what you're trying to accomplish. Not, Steve, which product do you want? This channel is already naturally acclimated to that environment. And it's better and superior to a direct way of doing it. So it's a perfect storm right now, really, to be in the channel. Where do you see the next big wave coming from? There's security, there's network, there's cloud services, there's hardware, 
there's consulting, uh, you name it. There's all kinds of opportunity for our, our customers via our partners. And so being able to pivot in those spaces is very important. I say from the stage all the time, if you're not asking uh, your customers about certain segments of technology, somebody else is. You have to date your customers. You have to be that lead expert. And so this hybrid distribution thing is here. It's relevant. I think it's going to keep getting bigger and better. The future is very strong. The future of the indirect sales channel is synonymous with the point of value. That's why we started using the word ecosystem. It changes people's thinking from what maybe a channel was in the past or what their concept of a channel is. It's not a channel of distribution anymore. When you're looking across your organization, and your product look, folks are looking at embedded and white labeled models. They're looking at technology alliances and the hundreds of thousands of software companies, almost a million emerging tech companies. The whole technology alliance space is a channel. The strategic and business alliances, companies are building into other ecosystems. You can't sell a car anymore, which is now a computer on wheels without being partnered up cross industry. A channel is this point before the point of sale, where we used to rely on MarTech, AdTech, and cookies to find out what customers were doing, doing during those 28 moments before they made vendor selection. Well, now as partner professionals, we're out creating partnerships in those 28 moments so that we can share in that experience as it may not be the partner collecting the customer's money, but they're actually pressing the buy button on behalf of their customer. The partner assist model as at that point of sale, and then obviously every 30 days after that in a subscription consumption model. So there's six swim lanes, which creates the future of the indirect sales channel. Each of them have their own KPIs. Each of them have their own measurements, their own kind of partners, monitor, monitoring and managing them at scale. And underneath all of it, it has a, its own tech stack with 223 companies that are innovating to help future indirect sales leaders do their jobs better. So it's a very exciting space. You know, what's uh, uh, incredibly amazing about our industry is that it's ever-changing and the pace of introduction of new technology is accelerating. We're also uh, seeing the spend in technology increase. Um, it's been increasing steadily in the past, you know, 20 years at single digit annual. It increased in the last two years during the pandemic by an additional 5%. And I think we're going to continue to see this because there isn't a business that is immune to the impact that technology can have on their competitiveness, on their ability to differentiate in the market. Because every single business is now offering or has to offer a digital customer experience. Isn't the future of the indirect sales channel always the like million dollar question? I think, first of all, there's been people that have been calling for the, you know, oh, the channel is going to fail for, you know, longer than I've been in the industry. And that's why at JS Group, our, you know, mission statement is just three words, save the channel. And everything we do, we try to save the channel. Channel has always had to justify itself whether it's for services, for sales, for promotion, for influence, whatever it's been, the channel has always had to justify itself. Despite the fact that 75% of the, of the products sold in every industry, not just in technology, are sold indirectly. But it's also going to be a lot of consolidation. We're seeing all the big companies come together. We're seeing it now in the telco and cloud spaces. I see this kind of flip coming where for the last 20 plus years, vendors have decided what's distributed through the channel. And we are kind of on a cusp of something I've been seeing the last year or two where the partners are determining what will be distributed through the channel. I think we're going to see a big change in the channel and how in charge they are of what solutions actually are sold through and with the channel. It's all security in my mind. It's all about that integrated state where customers have integrated networking with security. The facts are most of these companies are dealing with a very complex environment. They've got one provider over here for the firewall, whether it's in the cloud or whether it's on-prem. You know, they're dealing with some sort of secure web gateway. They're dealing with a CASB solution. There's a tremendous amount of complexity in their environment. So I think the next big wave is trying to figure out a way to simplify their environment. You know, really leaning in towards that integrated approach. It's all about integration, and simplification.
I think that's the next big wave. When did the light bulb go on? The Intellisys light bulb, the, the master agent TSB light bulb go on? Were you guys sitting at a bar somewhere, cocktail napkin? What was the birthplace of it? The birthplace uh, of really Intellisys and our understanding of the channel, I, I, I probably saw it first because it was thrown in my face. I was working for, for cable and wireless, as Rick had mentioned, and was doing extremely well, top, top five sales rep in the country out of three or 400 sales reps. And I saw this guy that always pulled up in a Porsche, the one that I didn't own, but, but had a picture of in my lousy cubicle that one day I would get. And he'd pull up in his convertible Porsche wearing his $350 aviator sunglasses. And this is 1992. And would come into our office, kind of salute our, our sales manager, go over to our, our collateral shelf and start grabbing all the brochures, put them in his backpack, kind of wave at the manager and zoom off in the car that I wanted. And uh, this, this happened a, you know, a couple of times. And I went to my sales manager and, and said, who is that guy? What's, what's the deal? She goes, who? I go, that guy that comes in with a Porsche and steals all our sales collateral. It came out that there was this program, this alternate channel, uh, program that cable and wireless had that none of us knew about. They were hiding it from us. Uh, so I went and, you know, went back to my office, to my little cubicle, pulled out my commission statements, calculated what I'd be making, and I'd be making in a residual two and a half times what I made last year. I made a lot of money that year. I was a top sales rep. So I remember Rick and I talking about this as friends. Um, and I, I was saying, yeah, there's this whole other thing. There's this alternate channel. These guys are agents. We started talking about this. And then, you know, as the universe sometimes plans it for you, I got riff. They closed our office in a reduction in force. And, uh, you know, Rick and I, you know, Rick and I went away to Lake Tahoe and talked about maybe starting a business. And, and that's how it happened for us. But it was hard. Those first couple of years were really hard. When he got riffed, he gives me a call and he goes, I got some good news and I got some bad news. He goes, the good news is we're going into business together. He goes, the bad <laughs> news is I just lost my job. <laughs> so I hadn't lost my job, but I, the writing was on the wall at my company. So we were living very parallel existences, even though different companies were around. And while I didn't get riffed, I, I ultimately was just getting the soft pedal, you know, uh, to another position, basically further away from what I wanted to be. And I knew it wasn't going to be successful. So Rick had a much more immediate need to, to start the business. Um, I was still making great money. I was being promised many things. But the reality was there was a rotten apple in that, in that whole organization. And it was at the top. Um, and I, I feel like that timing worked out really well for us. We spent six months planning it. Like It was kind of like, it would be like the great escape. The first 12 months, it was the drive to stay alive. And all we were trying to do as young guys was replace our incomes. That was it. We said, if we can just do that, hang on for one year, we'll be fine. And we did it. I think the hard part was we just were grinding. I mean, 24 hours a day. It was so exciting to wake up in the morning and, and go to work. But it was, now that I look back at it, it was a lot of work. And um, it was fun. This is how silly we were. Uh, to the, There was an interconnect that I knew who was barely keeping the doors open. He was in a sweaty warehouse that had, it was just awful. But he had a phone system with voicemail. And that was important to me because I couldn't afford a phone system. And literally a phone call would come in and I wouldn't know who it was. There was no caller ID or anything. And I'd, I'd answer the phone in sort of a, a, a receptionist voice. Thank you for calling in Telesis. How can I direct your call? Uh, yes, I'd like to speak to Rick Deller, please. Hold on. Let me see if he's available. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. Good morning. This is Rick. How can I help you? And I, I mean, literally, I would do that. It was so silly. But the things you do to, you know, sort of make yourself feel and act legitimate and, and it worked, you know. We had a series of values that we literally put on our walls. One of them was professionalism. We wanted to become Pac Bell, Pacific Bell agents, um, because we felt that would, we could put that on our business card. If you walk in and you say, I'm Rick Sheldon, 
you know, from IntelliSys or like, who, who are you? You know, but if you have the authorized Pacific Bell agent, that was a big deal. Rick got an appointment with the with Pacific Bell and they came out and they had to determine that we were legitimate. We shouldn't have been authorized agents based on the program they had. But they came around and we treated the entire place with and the, the employees that worked for the interconnect ended up being um, our employees for the day. We knew we could sell a ton of their product, but we didn't fit their criteria. So we changed the rules and we got, we got it. We got the authorized thing and we killed it. We really believed in ourselves. We bet in ourselves. We quit our jobs or we left or we didn't take high paying jobs. Rick could have easily taken a sales job down there, a six figure job easily. And we didn't, we made our big investment in Telesis was in ourselves. It was spending two years rebuilding our income and, and, and building a, an idea which turned into Intellisys, which ultimately all of the sales partners that we had ultimately were a direct reflection of what Rick and I wanted for ourselves. We took it personally. It mattered. And it still to this day matters to both of us that people had an opportunity because that's what we wanted. We worked our butts off to make that opportunity for ourselves. And we were, we were like on a mission to help other people get to the promised land. And we built a channel based on that. We really believed in ourselves. We bet in ourselves. We quit our jobs or we left or we didn't take high paying jobs. And then more that came, you know, behind us and really did a good job of elevating the industry. If you're not asking uh, your customers about certain segments of technology, somebody else is. Isn't the future of the indirect sales channel always the like million dollar question? The future of the indirect sales channel is synonymous with the point of value.